Fortress on a Hill with Henry, Danny, Kagan, and Giovanni. Welcome, everyone, to Fortress on a Hill, a podcast about U.S. foreign policy, anti-imperialism, skepticism, and the American way of war. I'm Henry. Thank you for joining us today. We're here today to talk with my friend and friend of the podcast, author and uh, podcaster Tom Secker, host of the Clandestine Podcast and publisher uh, at spyculture.com. Tom, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, Henry. Thanks for having me back. And uh, I'm looking forward to this one because... While not a great movie, there's a lot going on in it. There's a lot of interesting stuff thematically and a few petty gripes I just have with it as a movie. So this should be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we're here today to talk about uh, War of the Worlds, the 2005 film starring uh, Tom Cruise and Dakota Fanning that was uh, produced and directed by uh, Steven Spielberg. It is based upon the... um, the novel H.G. Wells' novel War of the Worlds that was, you know, most people know it was a, a famous story back in the day, and then it was turned into a radio program that literally was so real that it scared the people at the time, or at least some people at the time, into believing there was an actual uh, alien invasion going on. Um, it's actually Spielberg's third alien-type movie that he had done up, up until this point. Um, he actually quoted, he said that, uh, for the first time in my life, I'm making an alien picture where there is no love and no attempt at communication. He's really right about that. <laughs> um, yes. ET, so, this is not. ET, this is not. No. Um, so the, the film came out in 2005. Um, of course, you know, four, four or so years after after the September 11th attacks and the, the themes in the film are, are so much in line with the terrorism mindset that had, uh, had permeated everything around that time. And Spielberg sure tries to, you know, layer, layer it in there in some ways. So, um, let me, let me lay down a few little basics about the film so people can get an idea if you haven't seen it. And it, it's, it's, I, I guess it's kind of worth watching. I liked it a lot as a kid, but I think the flash and the bang got it more in my brain than the actual story was good or anything. Um, but uh, so Tom Cruise is a, uh, a um, container yard worker and he's divorced from his kids. His kids show up early to his house as he's getting off work and his ex and their her, her new fella, you know, dro- dropped them off there. And it's very clear nobody likes anybody. The kids don't even seem to really want to be there. Um, and then there's a literal alien invasion, and it, it really kind of follows the you know the classic kind of the the tentacles, the the whining sound in the air that really gets to people. And essentially, you follow Tom Cruise and Dakota Fanning and uh, their son. I don't know, I don't recall what the actor's name is. Um, trying to survive, just trying to stay alive. Um, from the moment the invasion ends, um, Tom, what, uh, what, 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 give me some initial impressions. What did you, uh, what came across to you watching this? Well, I saw this film first. I didn't see it in the cinema when it came to, came out, but I must have seen it a couple of years after that. And I didn't think much of it then. I like the idea. I like the premise of uh, we're telling a story of a apocalyptic alien invasion but we're telling it through one little family's attempts to essentially, like you say, just survive and try and keep moving and ultimately try and get to Boston where the rest of the family is. That's quite a nice little narrative to build an alien invasion movie around rather than focusing on the grandiose spectacle like in Independence Day. I mean, I guess after Independence Day, what's the point, really? (laughs) Um, (laughs) You know, you can't really top that for that kind of alien invasion movie. So... I like the idea of telling it through a microcosm, through a little story. I don't think it worked very well, partly because Tom Cruise, I don't think, was the right actor to hang this off. Um, I don't think he has that natural emotional sympathy that a lot of other leading men would have in that role. And it's, I mean, it's kind of a Roland Emmerich movie, right? Divorced guy. I mean, every guy, every male protagonist in every Roland Emmerich movie is divorced. Um, And part of the story is about him in some way reconciling with his estranged family. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but that's just a 
on you know almost every film that has <laughs> that sort of format in Roland Demerick world does that um I think the thing that that bothered me about it the thing that why this film never really settled right with me and I never truly enjoy or really get engaged watching it is the tone of it I think what they were going for was kind of um chaotic but also stark mm -hmm. you know there isn't that much going on in the frame in a lot of this film um there is quite a lot of static not a lot of people moving not a lot of people doing things interrupted by brief bits of tripods tipping ferries over or blowing stuff up or lasering people um and i get that that's what they were attempting and i don't think they quite pulled it off because i don't think spielberg can truly embrace that starkness he wants things to be a bit too nice mm. he wants something that's emotionally satisfying and a bit schmaltzy and family friendly and he does that very well you know when when spielberg the best spielberg films pull that off enormously well but i think when he tries something like this he doesn't quite know how to do it properly i mean to be fair it's a difficult tone to get right you know chaotic but also stark the only film that i've seen that really really did it like superbly well i think was mad max fury road another yeah. apocalyptic movie or post-apocalyptic movie um but you can't really do that with a Tom Cruise fronted family friendly alien invasion movie. So no. I think it got a bit caught up in trying to be too many different things at once. And that tone, they never really nailed the tone of the movie. Mm. And so hence it never really strikes me that profoundly. I mean, it kind of holds together well enough as a movie. It ticks along at a decent pace. It's kind of well made, well crafted film. Just tonally, I don't think they got it right. I don't think they achieved what they were going for, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, it 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 did it did seem like that they were that there was the the proverbial wall between the PG thirteen rating and the and the R as far as advancing it. You know, when they there was that scene where they Tom was watching that guy get his innards sucked out, but you didn't you didn't see the actual connection with the device. You know, it was one of their for people listening, it is one of their long tentacles and it has a giant alien needle at the end and literally just sucks the insides out of uh, of a human. But you don't really get to, I mean, you, number one, you didn't know the, per well, you did, the person wasn't on camera for any amount of time. They were just there for shock effect. And of course, you couldn't see their face. You couldn't see their body. You could, you know, and then the tube taking things up is just, you know, reddish. It's It doesn't, it doesn't really dig into that fear that someone could have about something like that happening to them. They could have made that scene much better shown the person trying to get away or with his family or anything, but it, it, it close up on the eyes, some kind of, yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't even really hear very much in that scene either. No, no, no. You're because he's, he's, it's at that point where he's still hiding with that, with Tim Robbins, uh, in the basement. Um, yeah, it, it, um, I'm sure we'll come back to that, uh, that part again. Okay. A little bit later, um, one of the first things that struck me was the when when the initial contact with the aliens was happening, and everybody and everything around Tom and his children is just freaking out, and he's he's freaking out too, but he's not saying a whole lot. They're just allowing the scene to kind of fill the space, mm -hmm. and at one point, Dakota Fanning says to him, "You know, his little girl is it? Is it the terrorists?" Mm -hmm. And and I. I guess it is especially for people that didn't, you know, they, they may have known people who died in 9-11 or were close enough to see some of the damage or the smoke or whatever. That is it realistic at all for a little 12 year old girl to say something like that at this kind of moment? And, and I, I guess it really it really depends on the on the people. But it, it felt really, really forced to me. Like, we're very clear. This movie has nothing to do with terrorists. Why would she make that assumption at this particular moment, especially a little girl? I could understand more if this was a, a teenager or a young adult. I, I could get that, but I, 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 it, I couldn't understand why she would make that connection at that particular moment, other than to remind us of what just happened in real life. Well, and it doesn't really work in the movie because we already know. Everyone going to watch this movie knows it's an alien invasion movie, right? 
everyone knows what War of the Worlds is. I assume um, it's hardly a obtuse or obscure cultural reference point. No, no, no. So there's no dramatic irony there. We know what's going on. It might work if it's a mystery at that point, and the kid goes, "Is it the terrorists?" And we're we in the audience sure. are sat there thinking, "Hang on, is it terrorists? What's what is this thing that's attacked?" But we know it isn't. So. Like you say, it's just really forced. It doesn't fit the flow of the movie and it doesn't fit with where the audience is at that moment in the movie. So therefore it feels off key. And like they've just thrown that in there because, oh, it's 2005. We've got to reference terrorism. Yep. If we don't say something about terrorism, someone's going to say something. And we, we just, we just got to do it. I also, I also felt that the, um, and, and granted, this is something that happens so much in movies, in, in certainly lots of American movies that... When Tom went and got his little revolver from his lockbox and threw it, you know, behind his waistband. And of course, like you said, we're, we're keyed up on what's happening. We understand that he might need that, but does he really feel at this particular moment that carrying a gun is what's needed right now? I mean, and, and granted, of course, I, I get into the, the real world, world mechanics of it, of somebody carrying concealed and having the gun taken from them and used against someone else. And especially in this movie when we get to when we get to that scene where he has the one working vehicle that the part of the aliens technology has um completely destroyed the ability of any of any motor vehicle to keep working and i think it was uh, a solenoid uh, that they mentioned about the uh mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Friend, of, friend of tom's had fixed the van that was the van that they took but that they had to replace the solenoid and then it and then it worked again um, yeah, yeah, it's because the alien technology or part of the attack is a big EMP blast, which fries yeah. all the computers and what have you in the modern vehicles. And I, again, that's a reference to terrorism. Mm -hmm. That's a, that was one of those things that they kept suggesting as a, you know, the next generation terrorist weapon in the early 2000s when, you know, everyone was just letting their imagination run away with them. And they were kind of picking stuff from movies and video games and saying, what if the terrorists do this? Mm -hmm. um yeah, yeah, yeah. and of course it never happened i mean i mean an emp weapon on that scale is a pretty difficult thing to pull off for one thing True. um but it was also that was one of the talking points is you know it could take out all of our modern vehicles because we all have you know essentially laptops in our engines now and so a big emp blast whether it comes from the sun or al-qaeda or wherever else could really screw them so that actually is kind of realistic in that part of the movie but again it's a kind of True clearly an allusion to what's been on the news there's no reason why an alien technology would use emp is there no inherent reason anyway other than just a, you know your standard warfare type kind of thing but other than that no i mean it, it, um especially if we're to believe they're friendly because they would want to contact people and people contact through their through their technology um so uh Going back real quick to the the scene where they're with the pistol in the van and stuff. So there's there's they make it to this uh, little area where there's a whole bunch of people that are trying to deal with what's happening, and they end up driving like right through a crowd, not like hitting people in the crowd, but very slowly pulling through this crowd of people just trying to get around, trying to get through, and then the mob actually takes the vehicle from them, mm -hmm. um, and it felt like that that whole scene that the the only real object you found out of it was this is why we need the military this is why the military needs to be here at this moment because this is what alien invasions do to people it just does it to them it doesn't you know it wasn't you know the we understood kind of the the mob mentality but it felt it, it like the other other stuff it felt really um their desperation felt forced. It felt it didn't feel like it was something that we had understood enough to be able to say, okay, that makes sense or it makes more sense. You know, why yeah, this is it's, it's never set up. It's never earned that no, bit where the, no. where the mob turns and decides to essentially hijack the vehicle. And there's a bit of a struggle with the gun and the kid and blah, 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 blah. Um, because we, we never know why, why did those people in particular, decide to take the vehicle when they've already been pushing through this big crowd for like several minutes by this yeah. point you know they've gone past hundreds of people none of whom tried to take the vehicle so why did those people try and take it they're never set up we never get to know them we never get to understand why are their motives 
or why is their mentality different to everyone else's? It's yeah. just, oh, we need this to happen because movie. So yeah. therefore it happens. And there's quite a lot in this film like that, where it's sort of, I get what they were going for. And it's not a bad idea at all. It's quite a good sequence visually. It works as a dramatic moment in the film, but you need to earn it and set it up better. Sure. It's, it's kind of lazy to, yeah, it, to just slap it in there. Yeah, it really, it really did kind of, kind of feel that way. Um, there was the other, another scene where um, the bodies go by in the river. Mm -hmm. um, that you know the, the no no setup no no foregrounding at all as to to what's happening just a little a little dakota fan a little blonde girl she's standing looking at a, a decent sized stream or a small river and there's nothing in it and then uh, two seconds later there is i don't know at least a dozen maybe two dozen bodies that just flow by and that might have made a lot more sense in different circumstances but we know that these aliens are turning people into chum to power whatever they do. So the fact that there are untouched bodies floating by in the river makes no sense whatsoever. And also, it really struck me as why that moment? Why did the, why did the fucking river choose that was the <laughs> moment to send all these very nice bodies right by? Um, it, it just, it, yeah, it just, it had no grounding whatsoever. Well, in the way, and again, if you want that sequence to work how about that happens i mean just to explain this this is after they've escaped the city and they're essentially driving through the countryside i mean i think the script actually calls it middle of nowhere hmm. um we don't see them cross over the river we don't see the river in the wide shot when the car pulls up to the side of the road and the kids get out we don't know there's a river there so why would we even be thinking about that? She just yeah. wanders down to the river, and at that exact moment that the kid is on her own wandering down to the edge of the river, that's when the bodies appear. You know what I mean? If you set up, there is a river. You, we get to see them driving over it. Maybe we get to see them looking down into the water. Oh, no, there's nothing there. There's nothing to worry about. Sure, but sure. maybe there's a sort of, you know, sense of foreboding building. You know, then they pull over. Maybe then the military go past first before the kids run off to go and pee in the bushes or whatever. You know, then it sets up the tone of, oh, something menacing. The military are here. Sure. Then they go down to the river. Then the bodies appear. You see, that's how you set it up and earn that moment. But it's a classic Spielbergian moment. You know, it looks great, but it's totally not <laughs> set up by the five yeah. minutes of movie that came before it. You see what I mean? It, it's, it's not that difficult to make this better. I'm sorry, I'm getting into editor mode here, but, but you know what I'm saying? I'm watching these movies thinking, if I wanted to build up to that moment, that's how I do it. And you've got all the pieces there. It's not difficult. Sure. So, yeah, I think they just they keep sort of missing tricks in this film, and it's a bit frustrating for me. It, it, it does, it does. Um, what did you think about the role of the, the son? There was a teenage, uh, Robbie was his name. Um, I, I I felt like that he they stole away most of what could have been some kind of genuine characterization for this angry young man who wants to do something. He's always you know, and and as the as the as the crisis goes on, as they're trying to survive and everything, you know, the they start seeing the military, and Robbie wants to go with them or go in the direction that they're going. And again, there's no explanation as to where this is there's no catch up as far as ray the dad being separate and robbie and like yeah he's gotten older gotten kind of angry gotten this and this and this we didn't we didn't get any of that and so I, I felt like they just reduced him to a um kind of a recruit stand-in you know the 17 18 year old kid who we want in the military and so that, that's what they would they they put in people the the mind's eye as to what he would be doing as a civilian still separate from the military but he's but you know what i mean though that he's, he mm -hmm. he won't stop trying to go towards this conflict that he thinks is pivotal both to protecting his family and for his own sense of self masculinity etc i mean that's the thing they could have set him up one of multiple different ways they could have just made him a kind of energetic teenage lad who's itching to do something mm-hmm yeah, you know, yeah, who gets caught up in this event as it unfolds around him. He couldn't, you know, but instead they sort of make him this slightly nasty, sullen kind of guy. Mm -hmm. um, 
but they don't explain why he's like that or why the relationship between him and Tom Cruise is so bad or anything really um they just sort of establish it and assume that the audience will go along with it um i did notice going through the draft script compared to the film because you sent over a draft script for this movie from i think shortly before the military review uh, mm. there's certainly a lot in it that it's referred to in the script notes in the military file on this film um they didn't really they certainly put in a few extra little bits of dialogue between the two in the film to try and build up that relationship and set up the both the departure the splitting off of the characters in the midst of the battle and then the reconciliation at the end of the movie because that's kind of the character arc or at least the emotional arc of the movie right mm -hmm. um because honestly the relationship between tom cruise and his daughter is essentially he picks her up puts her down somewhere tells her to stay there goes off and stresses about something comes back picks her up puts her down somewhere else tells her to stay there and That's the right. cycle repeats itself for like two hours there isn't really much of a relationship between them she is just a thing he carries around and has to rescue um whereas with the son they were actually trying to do something emotional mm -hmm. but partly because we never get to really get to know who these characters are or why their relationship is the way it is we don't even really understand what are his motives. Why is he running out into the road trying to jump onto the, the trucks of the Humvees as they're going past? It's never really explained. Um, it's just this sort of urge that he has for mm -hmm. some reason. And I think, I mean, yeah, like you say, he is a recruit stand-in character. If this movie was a, you know, TV series, and they have made two different War of the Worlds TV series in recent years, neither of which are particularly good um he would be a young man who actually goes off and joins the military and would maybe see him going through boot camp and so on um but in this film there isn't time for that but there was time to explain why we see him watching something on the news and asking questions about it we we get to understand why it is that he feels compelled to go and meet this with violence rather than following his dad's approach, which is just try and stay away from the danger for as long as possible, mm -hmm. um, which is actually the more sensible approach, as it turns out. Um, but they didn't bother. So I kind of think it probably fails as a recruitment character, you know, as a recruitment poster character, because while I can see some people who watch this movie, I'm particularly thinking of the Transformers crowd, uh, buying into him as shallow and poorly written as he is. Sure. Most people, like, I just don't see that. What What is there in that character for you to relate to and see yourself in? Sure. Um, you need to have more of that if you're going to try and get people to think, oh, that's me or some version of me. Maybe I should think like that. Maybe I should feel like that. Maybe I already feel like that. Which is kind of... He, he, like you say, he is just angry young man who wants to fight. Right, great. <laughs> so what? You know, yeah, right? Yeah, that's that's the character, the second character in this movie around which you're going to build your entire emotional arc. Well done, yeah. screenwriter. <laughs> um, and the and adding in some of the scenes, like when they got to you know to to the ferry, and they're trying to. You know, he, Robbie is really angry that there's not enough people on the ferry, which he's 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 accurate in doing. But I I, I asked myself is like between the two of them, between Ray and Robbie, that is Robbie's intensity supposed to impart heroism or the the the, the beginnings of heroism, and Dad his hesitancy as a if only temporary a form of cowardice. You know, is that this is this is what men do. They're willing to send their sons off to war if they can't go fight in a war. And so when we see because, you know, because you see it in his face. And, and I think Tom Cruise did a good job of it about the about the terror and the fear in a parent sending their kid off to the unknown. And that could be the military. That can be lots of different things. And so I, I thought that that part came across. But were they trying to impart that hesitancy and that fear as raise a coward you know because it was towards the end of the movie you know he stole that bag of grenades finally you know he grabbed the battle by the balls and magically the movie moves on to the conclusion um <laughs> you know it, it, it they uh always got to grab a movie by the balls tom you have to do and, it and, and don't forget <laughs> that is shortly after he murders someone almost immediately afterwards they get captured and stuck in the pod thing on the tripod and 
I, don't, I can't even remember where he gets the grenades from, but he uses it to take down that particular tripod. I mean, mm. honestly, I think that would have been better if he hadn't killed the guy in the basement just before that. I think that may have actually worked better as a moment of genuine heroism. But because it follows so soon after that, it is almost like, oh, he's just finally embracing the dark side, which in this movie is the good side, apparently, even though it turns out to be completely futile because this movie is deeply confused. Honestly, reading the draft script, I was thinking, um, I mean, we'll get to the ending, and it, this does play into that, but I won't give it away just yet. Just one of the impressions I came away with was, was this intended as a movie about the futility of war when it was first written? Because the military's comments, uh, their initial comments on it, were that they found that the military depiction in it was cartoonish or comic book, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it was like they just failed to stop the aliens. That's all they really do in that draft script. They don't actually do a huge amount else no. <laughs> in this story. And I did wonder, you know, as initially conceived, was this supposed to be some kind of anti-war or anti-militarism movie, or at least a movie saying that war is futile? Not saying, oh, no, no, you know, explicitly we shouldn't be in Iraq and Afghanistan, but that, you know, ultimately this isn't going to accomplish very much um, and turned into something else along the way. Or am I misreading it? And they just, they thought somehow that this, that it would come across as a tub thumping military movie, even though the military are useless for the first 98% of the script. <laughs> um, I don't know quite what they were going for there, but I did find myself again, caught up in this confusion while watching the movie as to quite, what are we supposed to make of this? Because in that scene, in the midst of the battle on the hillside, where Robbie wants to break away and he wants to go and join the troops, and, and Ray just wants to get his kids so, uh, somewhere off to safety and hide. It's quite a good scene, actually. I thought the interplay between the two characters was fairly emotive. Yeah. Again, completely unearned and not set up properly, but in the moment, it works sure. quite well. Um, and like you say, what are we supposed to conclude from this? Whose side are we supposed to be on? Because throughout the whole movie, we're following Tom Cruise. He interacts with other people. There's lots of characters that just come out of the woodwork to reveal something useful to the plot and then disappear, never to be seen again. But we're following Tom Cruise, essentially. It's his story. And yet, Robbie's journey at that point was probably the more interesting story, no? Because then Tom Cruise goes and spends half an hour sat in a basement with a right-wing crazy conspiracy theorist guy who's actually quite charming and probably right. Um, <laughs> and Robbie goes off and has an adventure, and we never get to see him again until the end of the film. And I'm like, why didn't we follow Robbie there? Yeah. That would have actually been more interesting, I feel. Because um, then we get to see the different experiences that they have. And we get to make some kind of choice or judgment ourselves. Which path would we take faced with this? Are both paths valid? Is one more valid than the other? All of those kinds of things. But it never actually gets into those questions properly. So it's kind of just left by implication that, oh, well, because he survives at the end, it's all OK. So yeah, fuck it. Send him off to go and fight wherever, because they'll right. probably live, I guess, maybe. Who cares? <laughs> it doesn't matter. It, yeah. it, it. Um, you know what I mean? The point kind of gets lost because we never actually understand why Robbie is doing this. And we never see him do it. So no. what's the point in that whole storyline? <laughs> you know? um, you know, going back to the point before, does it even work well as a recruitment plug? I don't think yeah. so. No, and and I, I think that the only the only viewpoint um, is that they you know they really wanted to solidify that you know his his trying to be a dad, trying to be a parent in these really awful times and that in awful times you send your sons off to war you know it, it, it doesn't really qualify as to what what awful times are going to be but that was i know i, I um we had talked about that when we initial initially mentioned discussing this one is it that the there were some really good like you said that that moment with tom and his son and then the one at the end where you can see that 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 he's clearly vacillating between supremely angry at his kid and yet so glad that that he's alive you know mm -hmm. he said entirely unearned it didn't didn't really make much sense but but in that way in terms of if you are the parent sending your kid off to the military that it did it, it saved it saved um it saved your psyche from the pain that the you know the loss of the kid was only temporary despite the fact that we didn't know that for most of the movie kind of like what would happen if someone was in a war depending on when the war was and how much contact they had with 
mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. back home. Um, but but that but the struggle of a parent to let go of their kid, the struggle of a parent to physically and of course you know metaphysically just okay I'm I'm, I'm you want to do this I'm going to say it's okay for you to do it I'm going to send you off and hope you come back at all and of course and hopefully hopefully in one piece and so you know you remember the line you know he kept saying it the kid kept saying it Tom you have to let me go you have to let me go and it's like dude you're not chopped in half from an alien wizard weapon right now about to die you're very much choosing to go in the direction of the death not knowing what's in that direction and not knowing if or how the military is succeeding or not succeeding in this battle but in his mind he's so convinced that he has to be there and that somehow his presence is going to do something it's not <laughs> it's not it's not going to do shit yeah this but, untrained sulky 17 year old is somehow so, going to turn the tide of this impossible war yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and 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 so and, and i think that that was the the you know, leaving leaving us with Tom and leaving us with, uh, you know, it was quiet desperation, but the desperation of a parent unable to know their kid is safe. Um, but I would think that people watching this would be like, we well, shouldn't we immediately put that on the military? Isn't that the the thing? Because we send our kids off, our kids are perfectly fine, and they come back as, you know, violent, sullen, PTSD, been through all these experiences. No one cared about them while they were there, why should you send them at all? But, but we, we don't dig far enough into the subtext to say, okay, well, this is what they were really going for, especially in a movie where so much is unearned. Well, and I also wonder again, around that scene is the message. The young man goes off to fight. The older man stays on the home front to fight a different kind of war. But the problem with that message is we see Tom Cruise then embracing violence, but we never see any of the violence that Robbie participates in. True. So it doesn't really work. No. In as much as this is a war movie, it's Tom Cruise who does the fighting and the military, obviously, but we never see Robbie doing it. So, I mean, maybe that's that's kind of the underlying delusion of what they were trying to do here. Maybe it's their delusion that we're actually tapping into here that we never see Robbie fighting. We never see him suffering. When he gets back at the end, he seems fine, bizarrely. Um, that's a very idealized version of what it's like to send your son off to a war. Mm-hmm. You know, you just don't hear from him. You're a bit worried, but okay, he turns up at the end and everything's fine. We never actually get to see him fighting or suffering or seeing anyone die or any of that. We see Tom Cruise seeing and participating in all of this. Mm-hmm. But he's the guy who ran away from the fight. So, are they also saying you can't run away from the fight? Again, it's that terrorist thing, whether we're fighting them over there or over here. You know, terrorism is a global threat. They could strike anywhere at any time. So even if you run away, you're still going to end up having to fight anyway. Is that what they were going for? Like I say, this movie's messaging is very, very confused. Um, but I think it is fundamentally an idealistic delusion that they're perpetrating on that, that son character. We, we needed to see more of what happened after those two split up. Yeah. We needed yeah, to see yeah. something of what does this actually mean? How does this play out? Rather than just following Tom Cruise as he sits in a basement for we don't even know how long. Um, it was a very strange choice to just keep Tom Cruise in every single scene in this movie. Maybe it was in the contract. Um, <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I mean, as far as vehicles for one actor goes... This is a dream because you are literally in every scene in the whole movie. Um, um. What's that? Uh, is that old Michael Caine joke? Uh, he might have actually said it. I don't know, but he was he was saying, you know, when I read when I read a script, I, I read the first page, and I read the last page, and if the character I'm playing is on both pages, then I do the fucking picture, you know. <laughs> um, and so and and Tom, you know, he is, you know, so much about Tom, about the power of Tom. And so mm-hmm. him him being up front and especially given that at this point when we saw him and of course it, it continued in the same way afterwards. But, you know, this was, say, we'll call maybe the, the midpoint of of Tom's action career. And so we have a lot of reflexive memory that goes into Tom Cruise 
being in danger and having to deal with whatever. Um, and I'm sure that that probably was, uh, was part of what they, you know, that both good for Tom, but of course for, you know, that they do get to keep it on this one person that they do get to have a slightly human type person, but they at least get to see the arc that he goes through. Um, back to what you were mentioning about, you know, violence being everywhere. We had talked before we started recording about the fact that the alien vehicles were situated underground prior to the invasion. And that actually is something that Spielberg added that was not part of the original HG Wells story. And so it, it, it really feels like that they were trying to set the stage for some kind of alien terrorist cell type thing. You know, in that way, that they just needed they just needed the pilots. They can bring these death machines now to do whatever they want with us whenever they want. Mm -hmm. um, but they didn't. But again, that wasn't something that was was fleshed out or understood. You know, we didn't see any archaeologists or anthropologists. I don't know what kind of weird scientists they get to help us science up up the movie. But in terms of like, just get the look, guy from Ancient Aliens. I mean, you know, yep, that would that would work too. Or or one of my favorite actors, Brett Spiner from Star Trek: The Next Generation, when he was the crazy scientist on Independence Day. Yeah, yep. you, you need a crazy scientist. Brent Spiner is your he is your guy. He um, is a go-to crazy scientist. He'll play he, it perfectly well, and he's and he's a really good exposition in character because he talks quickly. He does, he does. Yeah, no, the, the man's a magnificent actor. I I love almost anything that he does. Um. So let's see. I think what else was um. What did you think about? Because the the opening. I, I don't remember if the opening. Oh, can we just go back on that whole underground thing? For sure, moment. sure. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So there's two things here that that spring to mind. The first is you're right. It's a fairly obvious metaphor for a sleeper cell. And in case people think we're we're pushing this whole terrorist parallel too far or Iraq War parallel too far, uh, one of the entries in the Army's Entertainment Liaison Office reports on this movie says that while they were on set, while they were filming this, and they had their you know technical advisors from the military on set one of the things that they were discussing was how battle dirty the uniforms would look and they said they ultimately concluded not very just like in iraq they were drawing this parallel themselves so we aren't making this up at all <laughs> but the other thing it occurs to me is that i mean spielberg is a, a bit of a ufo guy he had a UFO experience in his teenage years, I think, possibly in his early teenage years. And this is one of the reasons why he's made so many UFO or alien or somehow extraterrestrial movies, something along those lines. He is actually like a ufologist in his way. And I do wonder, is he a kind of ancient alien guy? Is he a, you know, 2001, a space odyssey? They've been here for millions of years hmm. kind of guy. And maybe that's another one of the reasons why he added in this whole thing about, oh, the machines were always underground, they've been there forever, and they've just suddenly become activated now because that's when they decided to invade for, again, reasons that no one explains. Um, again, why now? Um, and it doesn't make much sense from a, if these aliens are smart enough to travel across the galaxy and bury giant military equipment underground in the hope of some future invasion, why would they wait millions of years to then activate them? Because in that time, exactly what happens in the movie would have happened, i.e. the atmosphere changes, new viruses develop, all kinds of other things. The condition of that planet shifts sure. uh, over that length, length of time. You know, <laughs> the fundamental composition of the atmosphere changes. So it maybe no longer becomes a suitable place to colonize. Um, none of this is, is, is really thought through in the movie. Again, there's a lot of kind of gaps and there's a lot of like you were saying just deus ex machina it happens because it has to happen for the movie to work yeah um and i did find that a bit problematic as well because i like the idea i like the setup and i kind of like that opening sequence where the lightning is coming down and it's only after that that the tripods start you know and they make that yeah. hand zimmer noise like the robots in pacific rim and like everything in movies these days to be honest um and they come down they start lasering and you know it all worked quite well and it's kind of had that nice sort of mystery sci-fi as well as action movie elements all coming together and then the movie starts falling apart because it just lacks for well well-drawn characters and proper emotional arcs um 
that's where the movie really fails, I think. But as I say, as a premise and as a type of story and as a way of telling this particular kind of story, there's a lot that's good about this movie. They just kind of got a lot wrong. And I think certainly the, the addition of, of working with the military, I don't think helped this movie at all. Because no. there's even things like, in, again, in that battle sequence up on the hill, um, just before Tom Cruise and his son have their kind of argument and then they split off, um, <laughs> this is one of those areas where the military had quite a lot of input. Their main input on the movie was uh, on action rather than dialogue or characters or anything else, because obviously there are no military characters who actually really say anything in this movie. No. Um, they're, they're present in quite a lot of scenes, but they don't really say anything as people. Um, and yeah, one of the discussions they had was whether or not they should stop the civilians who are running towards the battle. And this is where the, the script notes start contradicting themselves and get very funny, because on the one hand, they wanted to be seen rescuing people, and as they put it, evacuating people, and as anyone who has watched The Wire season five knows, you don't evacuate people, you evacuate buildings or areas. To evacuate a person is something different. Um, so they wanted that. And they do like that. You see this in a lot of the documents. They say in most kind of like asteroid disaster movies and stuff, they like the, the military to be seen in some kind of rescue or disaster relief role in Godzilla, that kind of thing, because it's a non-military role. It's a positive non-military depiction of them. Sure, sure. But at the same time, one of the, the Marine Corps reviewers writes something, I can't remember the exact words, but I sent you the, the, the snippet from the file. It basically says, well, we don't have very many forces at this point and we're engaged in this really difficult battle so if people are stupid enough to just run into it kind of fuck them let them it doesn't matter we're not there to stop people from killing themselves <laughs> and it's like it's one of the most marine core things you'll ever see in your right. life <laughs> but, um, and quite a surprising thing for them to have committed to paper you know what i mean it's one thing to say that on a phone call it's another thing to write it in a memo to a screenwriter um, <laughs> And, and in the end, it's a bit of a mix. You see both. You see, at some points, the military are just sort of ignoring the people who are running into battle and just letting them. And at other points, they're sort of trying to stop them. There's kind of a mixture of the two things on screen. So I'm not quite sure. Again, it's kind of confused. And what are we supposed to make of this? But yeah, I found that document in particular. That, I found that really, really funny because it's so cynical. But at the same time, what would you do in that situation? I mean, I guess you've been in that situation. And as you told me, you tried to stop people. And that's probably the right thing to do. But at the same time, it's a difficult choice because there's a battle going on. <laughs> um, you've got, you know, there's like 60 different things you could try and do there and probably 60 different things that your brain's telling you to do in those kinds of circumstances. So, yeah, I mean, sure, if you can keep your head and try and keep people away from the violence, that's got to be right. But I can also see why some people would just say, screw it, I'm getting out of here. And anyone who's stupid enough to go and join this fight, that's their choice, not mine. Um, it's a bit different if you're actually employed to be there and you're in the military, I guess. I don't know, it's a bit of a paradox and the film doesn't really resolve it in any way. <laughs> um, so it's kind of funny to me to see the military's perspective on this was equally as confused as the film is. Um, they said, we do want to be rescuing people, but we also don't really care that much. Yeah, they seem to not be able to decide either. It, 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 you said it's, it's like they're extremely weak and not really doing anything, or they're doing enough to push them back. There, you know, there, there's there's not any anything in bet in between, other than when towards the end, when then after Tom gets saved from the from the big alien robot that they had uh, stingers that there were uh, soldiers shooting stinger missiles. At the terrorists that just happened to coincide with with tom and you know kind of the the what they were doing towards towards the end of the movie um but in terms of like you know it, i kind of thought of it as kind of like what if this was um certainly could be iraq or afghanistan but what if this was like you know kosovo this is like you know a peacekeeping um type thing what you know what are the soldiers right there willing to do what are they capable of doing at any given moment and our different units going to be doing the same thing or opposite things. And it kind of went, I, I thought that they were trying to allow for the chaos to really come through. There's times where, you know, the victims of the aliens are military members themselves, that they are scooped up and turned into chum, just like anybody else. 
And so it, there was really that fight between do we actually have any lethality? Any uh, I hate that word. Do we actually have any lethal beings that are going to do anything against these things versus the guys on the on the on the barge on the on the uh, on the ferry just getting scooped up and and immediately turned into chum? Where you know trying to find some kind of consistency in there was just entirely non-existent, other than this is the chaos of war. We're not going to say it's the chaos of war. We're not going to imply that this is like any war that the United States has ever seen or done or anything, but that's what this is. And, you know, like the, one of the scenes where you had the, the tripods moving across the landscape and they are just obliterating everything in front of them. And again, like with the, with the, the riot scene with the van is like, this is why you need a strong military. We're not again. We're not going to say it, but we're definitely going to show you. We're going to show the entire American landscape being turned into a wasteland, and its people literally being turned into fuel. Um, that we're going to we're, we're going to try to hang on to that, but they don't they don't stick with you either, either way. I mean, you can't have it. You can't have it both ways, especially in a two hour movie. And it in like you said, there's it, it doesn't. It, it seems like it didn't even know. Um, have a full comprehension of what was actually happening. I thought about that with like the, the end of the movie with the, with the safe zone, you know, they get to this place that is, you know, visually has been untouched by the aliens. Why was it untouched? Why is this a safe place? Even though we never qualified what the fuck a safe place means in this in movie. This, what, yeah, what, in this context. This? Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, again, I think this is one of those areas where they came into conflict also with the MPAA and the censorship and the, you know, age ratings and all of that. Because, again, when I was going through the script, I noticed just how much more violent the action sequences are. And I don't necessarily mean in terms of actual firing between the tripods and the military. Mm -hmm. I mean in terms of how it's depicted and how people are reacting to it and how it's affecting them. Because there's all of this stuff about, you know, there's a lot of deafening roars and deafening explosions. There's even references to people's like ears blowing out and bleeding. We yeah. never see anything like that in this movie because it would be too gory. It would necessitate a higher age certificate and that means you've cut off half of your audience. I yeah. get that. But the problem is, if you're going for, this is the chaos, and ultimately the message is, we need the military to rationalize this chaos, I guess, is what they're saying. That only works if the chaos is believable and engaging and like real chaos is. Mm -hmm. Not if it's been airbrushed up to not be at all gory and we don't really see anyone suffering. We certainly don't see anyone in any kind of like prolonged pain. In as much as people die, they just get lasered and evaporate, and that's that. And right. even that doesn't make any sense. If they're using people's bodies as fuel, why do they keep lasering them? Um, <laughs> there's a lot in this movie that doesn't make sense. The aliens' tactics are not good. Um, the only reason why they're better than the military, actually, is because they've got ray shields, you know? Yeah. It's because the military's weapons can't pierce the shields. Other than that, the, everything that the aliens do doesn't actually make much sense or accomplish very much at all. Um, so... And there again, you could say maybe that's part of this whole metaphor about terrorism or at least the Middle East. It's that, you know, they're the kind of irrational, nothing they do makes sense. They live in these irrational ways. They believe these irrational things. Mm -hmm. That's why yeah, they yeah. need the military to rationalize the chaotic situation. Maybe that's something they were going for, or maybe they, these are just very badly written aliens. Um, it's hard to say. It's really hard to say. I mean, another one of these notes that um, I found in the military file, I just wanted to run past you. Again, it's in that scene where uh, they've stopped in the middle of the countryside and the army column comes past and there's like 20 Jeeps and Humvees and things mm -hmm. and, and, and he tries to jump on board. Or he doesn't try and jump on board, but he sort of tries to run out into the road and says, take me, you know, let me come with you. Um, in the original script, the soldiers in the back of the trucks and things are looking kind of terrified. Um, you know, it says like their eyes are big and empty. And on the in the army's notes on this it says these soldiers would look tense grim but determined not horrified with eyes big and empty they have no reason to think that they cannot prevail against the tripods at this point when in reality it's been well established that the tripods are essentially invulnerable at this point this is happening all over the world there's all kinds of news about this they would have a reason to think that they're basically riding into a pointless battle they would have every reason to be scared but 
there's again it's one of these delusions it's like oh no 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 no. the military would be sort of grim and determined we don't we don't get afraid before we mm -hmm. get into a fight yep. mm, some people do nobody's people being absolutely... against right here don't look over here nope yeah um and th there was another one that oh again in that battle sequence up on the hill the kind of the big action sequence in the middle of the movie uh, there's a bit in the script where the marines retreat and there's a big yellow post-it note stuck on the script in the file it says no retreat nope. <laughs> in the, note, nope. in the nope. notes it says Marine, marines do not retreat ever <laughs> no you beat a tactical withdrawal in the face of a massively superior enemy but that's not a fucking retreat is it Sorry, I'm kind of ranting now, but it's just there's so so many things in these file where, files where I'm thinking these people are crazy. You know that that's a retreat. I'm sorry. I don't care if it's embarrassing to call it that. Just be honest. If you can't be honest about this, then what the hell are you even doing in the military anyway? I thought I thought the whole point of this kind of perspective, this sort of stereotyped military perspective, is you know it's down to earth. It's you know we don't shy away from the truth. We 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 deal with the ugly truths of the world, and yet. Every time they write anything about a movie script, they go off into fantasy land and they're just denying obvious things that like everyone knows. It's bizarre at times. And this is one of the, you know, on this film, it really was quite bizarre. Yeah, it, it, it. The, the, the mentality of, of, you know, that we, we, we're, we're not going to present the idea of a failure or a retreat because even spouting the idea even having it be in a movie is too much reality for the reality that they live in um you know that the i uh, my, my grandfather was a was a marine you know he's in world war ii in, in korea and he was at the chosen reservoir where the marine corps had to do what they referred to as a fighting retreat that they were surrounded and and i mean they did they did break away and through very vicious fighting and it was during the winter where temperatures were ex exceedingly no low but the thing is, is 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 anyone served especially the historical side of it by pretending it didn't happen or that it wasn't mm -hmm. what it was that you know because because you know like you said is that in, in any war in any battle situation you're going to have advances and retreats We get asked often what people can do to help support the podcast. One really powerful way to help us grow and reach more people is to leave us a review. You can do that on iTunes, which is the best place to leave a review. iTunes does reach the most people these days. The next best place is Facebook. Go to our Fortress on a Hill Facebook page and look for the Reviews tab. Money is tight these days for everyone, especially in the lingering shadow of COVID. Penny pinching to make it through the month often doesn't give people the funds to contribute to a creator they support. So we consider it the highest honor that folks help us fund the podcast in any dollar amount they're able. Patreons is the main place to do that. And for supporters who can donate $10 a month or more, they will be listed right here as an honorary producer, like these fine folks, Fahim Shirazi, James Obar, James Higgins, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Tristan Oliver, Daniel Fleming, Michael Karen, Zach H., Ren Jacob, Howard Reynolds, Rick Coffey, and the Status Quo Podcast. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you so very much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt for some great Fortress merch. And now, let's get back to the podcast. Marines are, are no different. Sometimes they, maybe they're just in the wrong spot and we have to move them to you know, not have, have that happen. But because the so much of what military members perceive as the bad guys is the people they're going to fight is a is a you know a, is a a brain pollution versus something that actually fits into reality. You know how many of these people could actually give me a, a short two minute breakdown on how hard it, uh, the Iraq War was on the army? 
or or other things like that in terms of what was you know I mean, i'm talking get down to the really nitty gritty people just generally ignore it it was you know like thankfully these days the military is doing more about suicide but for how many years were suicides just absolutely off the scale and it was just ignored and it just it becomes a it becomes a brain loop that that they can't get around and especially because the guys that are still in have to enforce this you know america doesn't retreat america doesn't surrender we can't possibly make a movie where any of those things could be shown even if it's historical and accurate and fits the story they can't comprehend it they just can't wrap their minds around it uh what's the saying about the that uh um you can't explain something to someone when the understanding of that thing goes against what they live to do you know their job or their you know their whatever and so it, it just we're just seeing you know the brain worm of uh military you know head in the sand type stuff as you know played out as an actual movie played out as actual commentary about no retreat you know you um i know you uh we've talked at different different points about about fields of fire i'm sure i'm guessing fields of fire i, I haven't read it i've meant to but I, ha I haven't got around to it but i'm sure it's got some nasty shit in it i'm sure it's oh yeah got some retreating in it i'm sure it's probably got some stuff that it's like oh my god how did human beings live through that but we can't acknowledge that that's what actually happens and therefore we can't put it on our fucking movie screen and it it just blows my mind well and even especially with fields of fire even as they were giving that novel to marines as recommended reading so the novel is fine and mm -hmm. the screenplay which is based on that novel is very similar to the novel there's certainly like nothing major that's different about it and yet somehow ordinary people at home can't watch this on the screen mm -hmm. It's that difference between what can we tell our own people and what can we tell the people out there? They talk so much about wanting to, you know, break the, or at least some, find some way around the military civilian divide, but they're maintaining it. Mm -hmm. the military probably does more to maintain that divide than anything else does. So, you know, if you want people to understand this, put these realistic experiences up on screen, actually talk to these people, actually embrace this stuff and say, yeah, this is actually what it's like. This is what it's like for people. Because ultimately, that's really what matters. But their, their evasiveness and the, the absurd delusions that they engage in and the leaps of logic they sometimes engage in to try and avoid things that pretty much anyone who's been in the military knows is true. Yeah. It's, it's just kind of bizarre, especially when they're you know, saying they're doing this for the sake of accuracy and for the sake of presenting things in a way that people in the military or veterans or people who might be joining the military uh, it's useful for them to know this. It's good for them to see this. They'll feel good about seeing this. Well, how can people in the military feel that good about seeing a complex delusion masquerading as an alien invasion movie? Um, I, I'd be really surprised. I'd, I'd, I'd be quite curious, you know, to see what did people in the military make of this? Because it wasn't like that popular a movie when it came out. I mean, it did all right, but it kind of came and went. I don't think people heralded it quite like they did lots of other Spielberg movies. Um, and again, one of the things that's amusing from the file is that when they went to a, uh, some of the people from the entertainment liaison offices, they went to a preview screening, I think it was in New York, and there was a bunch of movie reviewers there, you know, people who were writing early reviews of the film. And they basically came away saying, well, we spoke to a bunch of them, and the consensus was that you know, people are going to like the sci-fi elements of this movie, but as a story, it kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I think they even knew before the movie came out, this this isn't particularly good. <laughs> you know, this isn't like going to be a, a classic movie that people are still watching in 20 years time because they enjoy it. I mean, we rewatched it because we wanted to rip it to shreds. So, you know. <laughs> but I don't think there's very many people who are watching War of the Worlds right now um, or remembering it that fondly. Um, but yeah, to get back to the the kind of the, the thematic confusion and problems with the film, this is where I, I think it's like a really, really key change that the military made. Because um, in the original movie, when they get to Boston at the end, and like you say, it's this sort of designated safe area or safe zone or something, and it's never explained why or how that's come about. Tom Cruise has a dialogue with one of the Marines or soldiers, and there's like a crashed tripod. And the soldier explains, oh, it was kind of malfunctioning and behaving really oddly, and then it just fell over. 
and it's like saying oh maybe the tide's turning maybe something's changed in this battle and then a couple of minutes later they come across another tripod right and the military managed to shoot that one down in the script that second tripod is also malfunctioning it's wobbling around it's crashing into buildings it's sort of careering about that's how it's described in the script in the movie it isn't it's working fine and it's only when tom cruise notices that some birds have landed on it and thus the shields must have t been turned off or malfunctioned or whatever and then he points it out to the army guy and the army oh right get the shoulder mounted rocket and fire it at the thing and they take it down mm -hmm. that changes because of the military they said in their notes I won't read out the page number and the scene number, but they say, <laughs> we believe it is very important in this scene that at least the one tripod to be attacked is still fully operational. The alien occupant so far apparently unaffected by the disease. We see this as a hopeful sign that, man that mankind in general and the US military in particular would in time develop an effective way to destroy the tripods one by one. They needed that scene in there where the military take down a working tripod. It needed to not be, you know, just on its way down and then they just sort of tipped it at the end. They needed to be shown as effective rather than just a, a completely pointless force in the face of a much more powerful force. And that single change to the end, it might seem subtle or even kind of unimportant, but I think it shifts the whole message of the movie because up until that point, it kind of is still a movie about the futility of war and how battle doesn't really accomplish very much, if mm -hmm. anything. Whether it's trying to be that or not, that's kind of how it comes across. You know, there is no heroic moment for the military until then. And so they had that rewritten to be more of a, a promo for them, more of a triumphant moment that shows this is why we have the military. And I know what you're saying. There's lots of little implications throughout it that make it a pro-military movie overall. But in terms of the core storyline, the military aren't very effective against the aliens. In fact, they aren't really effective at all. It's kind of like in Independence Day. And they had the same problem with Independence Day. They kept saying, you know, there's no real military heroes. The military don't actually accomplish very much. We're basically there to get wiped out. They even, there was even in the script for Independence Day, there's a bit where the Pentagon gets blown up. Mm -hmm. And that got taken out of the film. That was one of the things the Pentagon objected to, and it did actually get taken out, even though they never ended up working on the movie. So it's the same kind of thing. Even when it's an alien invasion, ancient alien invasion, that apparently left its sleeper cells here millions of years ago, it's that far ahead of us. Oh, the US military would still, in time, develop an effective way to destroy the tripods. Right. Right. right, right. <laughs> it's pathetic really but like i say you see you see what i mean how it just shifts the dynamic of the movie in terms of the oh totally how the battle plays out without that moment at the end of the film what's the point in the military uh, other than the implication like that else. like i say we need them to keep order in a chaotic world but in terms of the actual battle they're useless they're functionally might as well not be there so that's uh you know, the, the, I, I could see they could have, you know, when the sun departed, that they could have kind of split the viewpoint there and like gone back and forth between Tom with his basement stuff and the sun, like, let's say he finds a squad of Marines and he's like, hey, I can help you guys. What can I do? And he actually goes through that, like they, they fought for however long and we finally figured it out. We can do this. And we're able to stop them, to give it some kind of legitimacy, some kind of understanding that these these assholes and fatigues actually know what they're doing a little bit. And he, or even if they don't, that they're trying to figure it out. They're trying, you know, and mm. I, I don't know what that I mean, when people criticize it as coming across as too human, that the soldiers or Marines on the ground aren't sure what to do that they're they're you know dying one by one and they're trying to figure out they're trying different things trying different ideas and oh they finally figure it out well but they seemed weak you know while they were figuring it out they were weak and then suddenly they were strong it's like you know nothing about fucking war that's you know that we're, we're 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 trying to make these little you know cinematic microcosms that perfectly answer these questions that they think people have and that we have in our brains about the military what the fuck are you guys going to do but it, it it's so it's got such a chokehold around it 
that they never get to actually flesh anything out. And I, I, I would imagine, I don't know if Independence Gate got military help. I'm sure that they did at a certain point, but I'm guessing that they went, they were, went apeshit over some of the different things because it did make them seem weak. The president is fleeing. He's flying, you know, to wherever else with a, with a freaking ball of flames right up his ass. Um, you know, it, it, and it's like, yeah, he wanted to survive. It, is it, is a dead president better than a, a fleeing president? What, but, but, yeah, the, yeah. but that's the logic that we're trapped in here and no one ever steps outside and says, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Like people sense like ordinary, you know, metaphysical life <laughs> forget anything about the military or understanding why this happened or how it happened um the other thing with the with the stinger inclusion is the connection to um them supplying weapons to other groups supplying you know the, the doing you know sending stingers off to whatever moderate rebels are the are the are the hot ticket this week um and granted there was no there was nothing about that in the movie but just enough to see Oh, there's the military. There they're using the stinger. They're shooting the thing out of the sky or javelin. I'm not sure which it was. I never got to use that shit, but um <laughs> but uh but sure, no, some sort of shoulder mounted rocket. Yeah, yeah. And and or or like with the thing like them making it so that the tripod they shot down was still fully functional. What if you made the scene just a little bit longer and that in the process of taking down one that had lost their shields, they figured out a, a different weakness for ones that hadn't lost their shields yet. Have it make some kind of fucking sense. <laughs> but the 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 um but the 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 one thing I wanted I wanted to throw out here, and I think we talked about might have talked about it a little bit last time we recorded or time before, and it's about the the pictures and stories that people can kind of put in their brain banks as far as this is realistic, you know, this is whatever. And movies serve that a lot. You know, we if we ask people about saving Private Ryan, most of anything they would know about D-Day, about the following battles, about any of that stuff came directly from the movie. doesn't matter if it was historic or accurate or anything like that. That's mm -hmm. what people have been taught. And so that when people do come to something that has to deal with something real, an actual war, an actual, you know, what's going on in Ukraine right now, that they're met by such a thick amount of cognitive dissonance from the shit that they've already taken in, what they consider to be, you know, if they consider those films to be historical, accurate, authentic to the experiences anything like that and so you know it comes up there that you know because people you know remember the thing about about the rock and the chemical weapons the the mm -hmm. pearl con pearl configuration and how that actually in 2002 after 9 11 when they were figuring out how to go after saddam that there was some kind of intel that had come in about that and chemical weapons scientists are like yeah that doesn't exist it's not real. It was made in a fucking movie. It had, I mean, it, it looked neat for the movie, but it had no basis in reality. And so people have this, I don't want to know if I want to call it a faux reality or, or whatever it is, but they have this military cinematic fucking universe that they have to overcome as they're going through these stories. And they have to say, oh, Marines don't run. I'm reading about the Chosen Reservoir, and it says these guys, these guys had to retreat. Marines don't retreat. Yeah, that's in history, dude. You, you, th there is no argument to be had. It's not something somebody created off, off their ass. It's something that actually happened. And, and, but, but they have to fight that wall, the constant nagging of that doesn't look right. This isn't correct. No, that can't be accurate because Marines don't retreat. And, and, and that's the, you know, that's what people end up fighting themselves on and why sometimes when the real shit comes out, it's not appreciated when things like platoon or heaven and earth come out, they're really create films and really do dig into warfare and all the different things around it, that it seems fantastical, you know, it, more so than a fucking alien invasion movie. They just can't buy it. It isn't as emotionally satisfying. I think that's a big factor in it is. Yeah. Is, is that believing things, I mean, I'm just thinking of a, a couple of other ones that have come up in the, in, uh, I think that there's a reference in the in the database to how they rejected. Uh, I can't remember exactly what film it was, but they, basically they said the navy, as far as the navy is concerned, there has never been a mutiny on board a U.S. Navy ship, mm -hmm. so therefore we cannot support any movie with that storyline. And it's like, well, but that's not true. So what does it matter? I mean, who is the navy in this 
instance right. you know the navy doesn't have a consciousness it's an institution it's a bunch of people basically so who are we even attributing this view to this claim to that there has that that's never happened uh likewise there's um a movie about the second gulf of tonkin attack and again they rejected the movie and they basically said that it's you know the notion that this attack didn't happen is contrary to navy policy <laughs> yep mm-hmm so it's not contrary to fact you're not denying <laughs> that yep. what that pilot saw in the air that day and then wrote in his book and then wrote into a screenplay is true you're just saying it's contrary to navy policy right again you see what i mean about complex delusion <laughs> oh absolutely you know it's, it's like the the you know the shit that they say about the atomic bombs falling now that uh you know i, I saw something recently i was reading something about it and it said that the the was it the marine corps maybe maybe the arm the air force which you know of course was the army air corps during that time that they um it's revisionist you know no no sorry this is it, it's not it's it's no that's an entirely revisionist take we had to drop those bombs absolutely no question no anything and and they want people to have that hardened history they want people to to have those reflexive you know callbacks to the exact historical line that the US and other Western powers want them to have. They don't care if it makes sense. They don't care what kind of cognitive distance they create for anybody. They just want people to toe their line. So they don't, they don't even think for themselves about those things. I don't think they do sometimes because they really, I mean, I am consistently surprised by the things that they actually write down and don't seem to have any fear that one day someone's going to read this with a skeptical point of view mm -hmm. and sort of wonder, what on earth is this person thinking? Why is this person like reviewing movie scripts for $200 million movie projects? What on earth, you know, what kind of authority do they have? Because they seem to right. be nuts. Um, can I bring up one of my petty gripes about this movie? Shoot, man. Um, okay, so you know, early on, the daughter, uh, gets a splinter in her hand from like a banister rail or something I can't remember and, she, and there's this little bit of dialogue between her and Tom Cruise where he's like oh no, no it'll get infected you've got to get the splinter out and she says no 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 it'll be fine when my body's ready it'll just push it out I read that somewhere <laughs> okay this is obvious prefiguring for the eventual reveal that the virus has taken down the aliens and blah 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 mm. um they were trying to win some sort of screenwriting award for metaphorical prefiguring, I guess. In the draft script, there's a scene later on where she actually gets the splinter out of her hand and she makes the point again to her dad. I told you, you know, when my body was ready, it would just get rid of it. That, that scene doesn't appear in the movie. Why not? So instead, <laughs> she gets a splinter in scene 12 and that's it. Why include the first scene then? Yeah, it has it, there's absolutely no payoff to it now. You see what I mean? It's like there, there's lots of payoff in this movie that has no setup and lots of setup that has no payoff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I know it's just a splinter and I'm probably obsessing over this because I get frustrated with bad screenwriting. But like even that, I mean, there's several other little things that they have in the movie that are kind of prefiguring the ending and setting up the ending for you, which honestly, I don't think it needed. I think maybe it works better as a sudden reveal that actually everything's okay. Um, because given that your point up until that is it's all just chaos and no one really knows what's going on, kind of implying and hinting throughout the movie, don't worry, it'll be okay in the end, yeah. it takes away from that, it undermines it. And again, it would make the reconciliation between the dad and the son at the end of the movie all the more powerful. if it wasn't heavily implied that it's okay, it's a Spielberg movie, it'll all be okay in the end, because it always is. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's just, there's so many different sort of weird mistakes that they made in the course of this. And like I say, that splinter thing just stood out to me, because it's like, either have both scenes or have neither. Yeah. Don't have the first one, but not the second. Because <laughs> said it's screen time for something that doesn't even make sense. I mean, it, it seems like a waste. Well, to create more screen time for Tom Cruise wandering around in a basement. That, that, there's, there's that. We have our man, Tom. So, um, Should we talk about the Tim Robbins character a bit before we wrap this up? Because uh, yes. I love yeah. Tim Robbins. <laughs> I, I do, too. I, I love, I, yeah, he's, he's fantastic. And I thought, he was, I thought he was good in the role. I think that they could have used him better. 
but I thought he did a, a really good job of the of the the paranoia and the things you know just saying out loud kind of he's mm-hmm. he's talking to Tom but he also could be talking to himself you know well at some points he's like talking to the aliens he's saying things <laughs> that he wants them to hear so it's really this kind of you know these voices coming from different directions and going in different directions and he's in some ways the most three-dimensional character in the whole movie um I, I wanted to spend more time with him i wanted to hear more of his slightly crazy but at least not totally pointless nonsense um that he was talking about this situation because i mean he's not wrong in some of the things he says some of what he's saying is totally batshit don't get me wrong that's his role in the movie yeah but at the same time, he does actually say some things that make more sense, certainly more sense than just let's sit in this basement and wait for what exactly? I mean, yeah. he's the one saying we need to go and do something. And Tom Cruise is like, no, 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 we have to wait here. Why? Um, he never really explains. So that's not a very convincing counter argument. Um, and then in the end, he, he, Tom Cruise ends up just running out into the open anyway. And what inevitably was going to happen inevitably happens. Yeah. So the guy isn't even really proven wrong, in which case Tom Cruise just needlessly murders him. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, 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 there was, there was, there Is was the murder too, justified. Yeah, it was too drastic a turn in that way that the, wow, you know, we, we've gone from, okay, I'm, I'm relatively safe in this guy's presence to he needs to die now. I don't know what this weirdo is, is capable of. And like you said, it wasn't, it, it didn't seem justified. It didn't seem earned in, in that way. I mean, certainly he was, he was certainly discomforting, but he wasn't, you know, it, I don't think the audience was to that point. And then Tom goes to, to deal with that and puts on little girls headphones and stuff. And, and it's like, I, I no, I don't think, I don't think it, it, it just doesn't make sense. Or it doesn't make sense that Ray, this relatively kind of underperforming guy in life, you know, he's a bit of an underachiever. That's sort of how he's set up, right? Though he does live in a house that has a lot of nice dark wood paneling, and his bedroom has, I noticed, both, not just both drapes and curtains, but also blinds, um, which seemed a bit unlikely for someone who isn't really that together in his home and doesn't have much money. <laughs> anyway, whatever. Um, that why is he pushed to such an extent that he feels that it's necessary to kill this guy? What what sets that up in the movie? He's the guy who keeps trying to run away from the fight, right? Yeah, yeah. So why doesn't he just run away somewhere else? Because they keep saying, oh, the tripods are out there. The tri-, but the tripods aren't out there continuously. No. There aren't tripods just walking past that particular farm all day long. Um. And they're there for like two days or something. <laughs> um, I don't understand. Why doesn't he just run off? If he thinks this guy's crazy, go find somewhere else to hide. There must be no end of places around here you could potentially hide. And after killing him, that's kind of what they end up just doing anyway. It's not like they they then hang around at that farm for another week. Yeah, they use it as a hideout or nothing. They just take off. So why didn't they just do that rather than and leave the guy to do, you know, he can pursue his own fate. And it's especially it really kind of like, and in this quite kiddie movie, why did they even need that murder? Unless, as we were discussing before, it's part of this arc that like, even the guy who's trying to run away from the fight will still end up being lethal because that's just the situation we face. Everyone yeah, I, has I, to fight, everyone has to kill. I, I thought that along with the whole grenade thing, both him finding the grenades and using the grenades was was that that conclusion is that we finally we finally pushed him so far that he's picking up a gun and he's yeah. like okay we have to have to fight these guys but it took you know two-thirds of this movie to get him there but finally he's there finally he's on the right side or the right whatever um and it doesn't it do, no there's no it doesn't it doesn't make any sense especially wanting to keep his his kids safe and choosing to kill that guy could have gone wrong very easily and he could have ended up being the one dead and also you don't know what's going to happen to his kid if something happens to him he was willing to take this risk on someone that probably didn't need to die just a dude that 
has has his own theories. He hadn't anywhere gotten to the point where where he actually seemed lethal in some sense. But I think that I think that was the thing is that the when the, after the sun departs, here's this crazy dude that's kind of gearing him up and everything, and then we get to finally there he goes off into you know have the fight that we wanted him to have this whole time, even though it 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 it, it, it seemed like his character knew the whole time that hiding and running was all they could do realistically it seemed like that, that he he understood that and was committed to that idea and then suddenly magically grab grab a belt of grenades oh look yep notice that the birds they're not hitting the thing anymore yeah where, he's now fully fucking army movie? intelligence he's the one that's winning the war right where where the fuck was this guy the whole damn movie where, where was he, where you know you just you don't see him it just magically transforms into this dude ready to fight ready to shoot you know do whatever is needed to to win the battle and you know we had to we had to drag him kicking and screaming the whole way to get him there well the way to get him over the edge is to simply lock him in a cellar with a guy who kind of won't stop talking because um, the guy isn't really like <clears throat> making him do anything or stopping no. him from doing anything if anything tom cruise is the one trying to control him he's mm -hmm. the one saying no we can't go up no don't say anything no don't make any noise all this kind of stuff the other guys just sort of sat there going yeah i'm gonna you know, drink my peach snaps and <laughs> rattle on about tunnels and <laughs> nope. whatever he's, he's kind of harmless really i mean crazy but harmless um that's that's the thing they needed to play him up more and make him more of a danger and more of a threat in order to justify Tom Cruise killing him. But again, because it's a PG thirteen movie and because Spielberg doesn't far. actually know how to write crazy people or dark dialogue or anything like that, they couldn't do it. And so, all we end up with is Tom Cruise murders someone for no apparent reason, which I know we've seen before, but not in a like I say, family friendly Spielberg movie. Yeah. Again, yeah. it's to totally doesn't fit. It's from a different movie. Um, there's several things, like you mentioned, with the bodies floating past in the river. That's great in a horror movie. Sure. But this isn't really a horror movie, or they hadn't set it up as that. So why is it suddenly lurching into these different kinds of movies and trying to be six different things at once and not really accomplishing any of them? Um, and as I say, I don't think it even really worked that well as a vehicle for the military, except in the more, most general sense of yeah. kind of, aren't you glad the military exists? Because if something like this happens, they're the ones who are going to deal with it. Um, but aside from that, it's like, we don't get to know any military people. Uh, we don't know what the military chain of command is doing. We basically just follow Tom Cruise around for about two hours as he doesn't accomplish very much but moves through this chaotic world and eventually there's a resolution at the end because i'm also wondering that could be the script for saving private riot too so <laughs> <laughs> yep. yeah pretty <laughs> yeah you're right you keep bringing up saving private Ryan, but you're right this is saving private ryan with alien tripods yep. um pretty much <laughs> <laughs> oh god that's 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 a really good one-line summary of a movie. Um, what else have we got here? Uh, sorry, I'm just looking down at my notes. Oh, yeah, there was one other thing that I did ponder about this. With it being uh, the disease in the end that takes out the aliens, is this also, to some extent, a story about the colonization of the Americas? Because in that story, both the colonists and the indigenous people encountered lots of diseases and what have you that they hadn't before and it wiped an awful lot of them out in some cases through deliberate germ warfare and things as we know mm -hmm. um but in this story the aliens don't bring any viruses with them it's only our noble earthbound viruses that are part of the story <laughs> um so even that's kind of confusing that and, and wouldn't an alien civilization with this kind of technology have already gone over that hump wouldn't they have figured out a well, way I, to protect themselves? Or did, I mean, it's, it, 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 where, where does our, I mean, our... Prior to the invasion, let's just imagine, yeah. they send a few probes to Earth to sample the atmosphere and see if there's anything nasty in it that's going to cause them problems enough that's going to kill them in 36 hours. Yeah, they might do that. 
rather than travel all the way across the galaxy, create a lightning storm come vortex thing that activates the underground things that they buried millions of years ago, only to completely pointlessly try to invade Earth and then die three days later. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It would make more sense from the, for the aliens to do something like that, especially since sending probes to Earth before colonizing it is kind of a fairly established trope in sci-fi by the point this film was made. Um, but again, people don't think like that. And it's, it's kind of funny because two years later, Spielberg produced Transformers, which, I, I mean, it's all about these alien robots that come to Earth. Again, it's a UFO extraterrestrial movie of a sort. That's why Spielberg was interested. But those aliens don't face any problems, again, with Earth's atmosphere or anything like that. Um, wh where does the line begin and end in terms of plausibility? Because... If you're going to try and make a realistic movie about an alien invasion, or you're trying to make a somewhat serious movie about extraterrestrials, whether it's an invasion and violent action movie or not, do you not think these things through? Isn't that part right. of the point of making the movie, is to go, what would this be like? What would the challenges that both they and us would face? And how would that interaction play out in a way that might actually be engaging and surprising since we are ultimately trying to make a piece of entertainment here? Um, See, I, I would have appreciated like a, 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 a some kind of a small battle setup where they actually you see American hardware trying to deal with their technology and them trying to adapt to it. You know, really, you know, seeing guys try to set up, art, you know, set up artillery and, and different things. And there was like, I think there was one flyover. There was one military flyover, and they shot. They just shot it down, um, because that's a that's a huge part of any kind of warfare battle situation. Is how are the tactics that these people already have developed dealing with the actual alien threat? Certainly, they can adapt as they go. But again, it's like the retreat thing. Is that these are almost always parts of any kind of warfare situation why doesn't it take those other steps? Another thing that you could point out would be like, where are the rest of the aliens? Because certainly not all of them are currently on planet Earth dying because of our very, very heavenly viruses. Um, you know, it's like the, like the mothership from Independence Day. You know, we knew that there was a huge cadre of other aliens on this giant ship. And of course you have, but they didn't establish anything like that. They didn't, I mean, no. And and like Spielberg bragging about the fact that he doesn't have to, the aliens don't have to talk. Well, any kind of situation in terms of settler colonial, colonialism or occupation by, by foreign forces has to deal with those kind of things. How are they going to actually interact with each other? How do they know anything about what's happening? Independence Day, even, I mean, there was very little alien dialogue. Remember when they Brent Spider and the whole tentacles thing and talking yeah, yeah, about yeah. that? But, but at the very least, they did speak to them. They did hear from them directly, and this is how they feel about the thing. But they, they want us to immediately, we, we look at the U.S. troops, we look at the U.S. personnel who could or would end up getting injured, and we don't look further. We don't look for any other mm. second, third order effects. We're not looking for people that are injured in other ways because those people were trying to kill our beloved soldiers. Damn it. Um, and and it, it it this seems like a, a very big step between some of the older Spielberg stuff, especially alien stuff, and the movement into Transformers, Battleship, all these other really, really massive alien type movies and stuff. But Man, in terms absolutely. of the, the 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 half step between the two and really grabbing on to all of the war aspects without criticism of the American response or the American action. Yeah, sure. I mean, when you go back through the history of this particular genre of movies, they do tend to break down into one or the other. You either have the single alien who comes from beyond, who isn't fighting or trying to take over or anything like that. Maybe they've come here by accident. Maybe it's on purpose. But they have some kind of communication and the whole thing is about, I guess, understanding. Mm -hmm. You know, we our understanding is being opened up by this arrival from beyond. Or you have the they're there to steal our lovely Earth's magma, a la <laughs> Independence Day regurgitation, and just want to destroy everything. And we have to fight. Yeah, uh, there's a lot more of the second kind 
in the last 20 years or so, a lot more. There used to be more of the first kind, but they seem to have largely, not entirely, but largely fallen off the map. What was that one from 2016? Is it Arrival? Yeah. And it's the one that's all about the, the aliens drawing the circles and she has to try and understand how their language works and all that. And in that one, there is a brief military depiction and they're completely useless. They try and blow up the alien ship and basically end up blowing up themselves. Yep. <laughs> um, you can tell that one wasn't DOD sponsored. Um, but, you know, Independence Day Regurgitation, Man of Steel, Pacific Rim, all of these. Um, some of the recent Star Trek uh, TV adaptations, I think, have been military supported. Yeah. Um, and it is all just about how many like spaceships and aliens can we get on screen at once blowing each other up? Mm -hmm. um, and you're right, this movie is a bridge towards that because we don't actually get to see that much fighting. The fighting is going on in the background or adjacent to the scene that we're watching and we see the flashes of explosions and the sounds and everything, but we don't actually get to see that much warfare in this movie. Um, it's a lot like um, the 2014 Godzilla in that respect. Um, in fact, I think there's several sequences that are almost shot for shot the same, thinking about it. But anyway, um, yeah, this was a, it opened the door to what is now the modern alien invasion movie, which is almost always DOD supported and almost always follows the same kind of basic philosophy of the only option is to fight. Yeah. Well, there's a there's hundred other options. There's always a hundred other options. Um, there's this myth that it's fight or flight which is kind of what this movie is about. Do you pick to fight or flight? Mm -hmm. uh, that's only two of the options available to you. And the myth that that is our kind of like fundamental brain instinct, or that's just how we're wired or something, is nonsense. We're capable of so much more than that. And I mean, I know we haven't actually, as far as we know, faced an alien invasion on this planet. Regardless of what problem it is that we're facing, we're capable of so much more than that. And uh, I just... I wish more screenwriters would embrace that, the sheer complexities of what humans are capable of, both the good and the bad. Yeah. Because this, because this movie is so simplistic. That's the, the overriding thing that pissed me off about it is just how simple the movie is. Nothing is treated with any emotional breadth or depth. Nothing is discussed in detail. Most of it doesn't really make an awful lot of sense. We just know that Ray is trying to get away and keep his kids safe, and there's an alien invasion going on some stuff exploding that, that's the most sense we have yeah um but that doesn't make for a particularly <laughs> kind of uh, interesting movie to watch we needed more and they could have done so much more with this uh particularly given the kind of money that they spent i mean it all looks good you know it's a well-made movie in production value sense but oh totally I just think I don't think they ever really made up their minds quite what sort of movie they were going to make. And then the military came in and said, well, we want you to make more of this sort of a movie. And they went, OK, we'll add that dimension to our pre-existing list of like 12 different things we're doing with this movie. Um, and it does end up as a bit of a befuddled mess by the end. But I do think thematically it touches on so many different things without really saying anything properly or clearly about any of them. Yeah. And that's possibly what bugged me. That I think it's trying to be a message movie or a commentary movie in some sense. But what is it commenting on and what is it saying? Yeah. Um, as we found for the last sort of 90 minutes we've been talking about it, we're not that sure. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we've been kind of picking it apart almost scene by scene, but it's what is this movie about? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know, really. I mean, just that thing about the, the aliens and what their motives are and how we don't really know why they're here or any of that. Again, in the original screenplay, in the uh, montage sequence at the start, before the voiceover by Morgan Freeman, where he's saying the thing that Orson Welles said in the radio version, um, that, again, in the original script, is quite played out. And it's sort of implied that their planet... Um, it's the usual story, you know, their planet has some kind of resource or atmospheric problem, so they have to find somewhere else to live. Uh, or at least it's, it's kind of implied like that. I'm guessing that's what this visual sequence is supposed to be saying. But that's not what they did. In the movie, they make it all about viruses. It's all about how, you know, a single drop of water contains all of these different microbes, and then they kind of have the panning back shot, and it's, oh, the drop of water is the galaxy, and blah, 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 blah. Um, and so, again, 
they missed a trick. They missed an opportunity there to actually set this up in a way where we would understand why the aliens were doing this. And I do wonder, given all of the metaphors about war, militarism, particularly terrorism, that seem to be coming out in this movie, whether again that was the point is to give them make the aliens as alien as possible we don't understand them we can't understand them and when you can't understand someone and you can't communicate with them what choice is there left but to fight to just struggle with them for territory um maybe it's that always was, so much more interesting was, uh, when the aliens actually have a character maybe that was the idea with him killing tim tim robbins is that this this is this is the first step we know he has to take to get to the, the bigger violence next mm. and okay it makes enough sense we'll kill him he's a weirdo whatever whatever um but in terms in terms of their you know hard points in the story is like we do this and that gears them up en enough to do the next thing even when the first thing made no sense in the first place mm. it's a problem <laughs> <laughs> well i uh I think that's you've got to get running soon, haven't you? So I guess we should probably wrap up this. Um, I did. I did. <laughs> um, thank you, as always, Tom, for coming to chat with me. These are some of my very favorite uh, episodes that you and I uh, get to make together. Um, will you let the listeners know what you're working on now and where they can find your stuff? Uh, sure. I mean, the one-stop shop for all of my stuff is spyculture.com. That's where you can get my articles, videos, podcasts, links to other places I've done talks or other radio shows or whatever. Um, what I'm currently working on, I mean, we're trying to, we're about to gear up for a proper promo effort on Theatres of War, the documentary, because we've essentially been waiting for some funding to come in in order to do that. Um, the other thing I'm working on is kind of an updated, it's not like an updated edition of National Security Cinema, it's a whole new book that mm. Matt and Roger and I are working on together that is an attempt to be a much more comprehensive analysis of this whole thing. I mean, we can't, we've got so many documents and so much information now that we couldn't fit it all in. It's not going to be like a catalog of government involvement in Hollywood, mm -hmm. but it is going to try and, you know, push the boundaries of what it's possible to research and say about all of this and how all of these strands come together over time, both the history, historical stuff and, you know, everything that's been going on for the last 10 years or so. So yeah, that's what's that's what I'm working on, and obviously podcasts and articles and all the usual stuff on my site. So yeah, spyculture.com. If anyone wants to hear more, um, very excited to read that uh, new book when you guys are able when you uh, get a little further along. It sounds it sounds great. It it, it uh, it's it's I, I know how much my mind was blown of reading National Security Cinema. So something that is even more comprehensive and more detailed is going to be that much more powerful, and certainly touch on that. Uh, that many more films and projects and stuff. Um, so yeah, please keep, please definitely keep me posted on that. Well, and a little bit like the superhero book, it's also, I've, or at least I've been very much pushing for a kind of a thematic approach. So we mm -hmm. take some of these big themes, whether it's mental illness, nuclear war, whatever it may be, and just trace, you know, how did this play out across decades worth of films and TV shows that we now have documents on? And what are they trying to do about these? Because these are some of the biggest themes that affect our everyday lives. You know, these Absolutely. all matter. That's why the whole kind of entertainment liaison office thing matters. And so that's what I've been pushing for with this book. So hopefully it will at least have some dimension of that to it. But yeah, yeah, I'll let you know. I'll let you know. And thanks for having me again. This has been another great conversation. I have really enjoyed it. Of course, yeah. Uh, we will uh, we'll certainly do this again uh, sometime soon. Folks, mm -hmm. thank you for uh, for your time today, for listening to us. Please do um, email myself or Tom if you want to to uh if you have suggestions or recommendations for movies for us to watch and cover because there are so many out there and some are more um certainly good examples of the kind of stuff that uh that tom writes about and covers uh thank you all for joining us and uh hope you take care <laughs>